Hello, and welcome to a lecture on circular horns. I'm Steve Ellingson. First, an overview of this lecture. I'd like to give you a note on terminology. Uh, I'm going to use the term circular horns. Uh, circular horns are horns which are based on circular waveguides. So here's a circular waveguide and then are flared out in the same manner as rectangular horns, which we have probably addressed in a previous lecture. Now, in some cases, such horns are referred to as being conical, referring to their conical shape when you flare a circular waveguide out into a horn. I'm going to generally use the term circular, which refers to the cross-sectional uh, shape. These terms are really interchangeable, and you see both in common use. Now, why are we interested in circular horns? There's really two reasons. One is the potential for improved pattern balance. And by that I mean E plane is about the same as H plane is about the same as any other plane or pattern cut. And this turns out to be useful in the design of axisymmetric paraboloidal reflector antenna systems. Circular horns also give us some other options that turn out to be useful when we're trying to tailor a feed for a particular type of reflector antenna system. So here's how this lecture is organized. First, I'll talk about the TE11 circular waveguide mode. That's the basic mode that we can use in a circular waveguide. And then we'll do the usual thing, or usual at this point now. We'll hornify it. By that I mean we'll take the waveguide and we'll flare it out into a horn. Then we'll talk about an alternative way to do this uh, using the TM11, transverse magnetic 11 waveguide mode, which is another low order mode that we can use. In particular, if we combine the TE11 and the TM11 mode, we'll see that we get a Huygen source. And we've already talked about Huygen sources and the fact that they uh, have great utility in a number of applications. And in fact, the particular horn that we'll get when we do this is known as a Potter horn, also known as a multi-mode horn, and it goes by uh, several other names. And then I'll give you some concluding remarks, including other options for horns that we're not gonna discuss in detail, but which you'll be ready to consider uh, at that point. Okay, first, the circular waveguide. A uh, circular waveguide is simply uh, a waveguide which has a circular cross-section and the lowest order mode that we can get out of a circular waveguide is the transverse electric 1-1 mode which looks like this. Um, it's uh, one way to see how it comes about of course is to just imagine an electric field which is polarized like this in the center of the waveguide and then realize that E tan, the tangential component of the electric field, has to be zero everywhere on the waveguide walls, which means the electric field lines must be perpendicular to the waveguide walls at every point where they meet. And so you get a field structure which looks like this, and that's known as the TE11 mode. Now, of course, you can also do this rigorously. You can uh, solve Maxwell's equations for a circular waveguide and you will find that an infinite number of modes are possible, of which TE11 is a loader mode. Now we can make a waveguide carrying a TE11 mode uh, into a horn simply by flaring it out. And this is the usual deal. We have the field and the waveguide, and then we flare it out. So in two dimensions, it looks uh, just like a rectangular waveguide. But of course, instead of having a rectangular aperture, we'll end up with a circular aperture. And we have all the same issues that we had with rectangular horns. In particular, we find out that there's this trade-off where in order to increase the directivity of the horn, we have to make the axial length, that is this length, longer and longer to avoid this problem of phase cancellation where we have this uh, variation in phase where some sections of the aperture start to cancel out with other sections of the aperture. So we end up with a built-in limitation on uh, how high a directivity we can achieve for a given axial length. Now there's another mode that we can consider using here, and this is the TM11, transverse magnetic 11 mode. Now these are E-field lines again, 
In both cases, I'm showing E field lines. Here's the TE11 mode. Here's the TM11 mode. In both cases, you see E10 is zero at the walls of the waveguide, as it must be. Uh, so we end up with these uh, fields which are non-zero, to be sure, on the waveguide walls, but which are polarized perpendicular to the wall. In the TM11 mode, however, we have this new different kind of field structure. Uh, in this plane, it's identical, but in every other plane, you see some variation. For example, the field lines curve like this in the TE11 mode, and they curve like this in the TM11 mode. And then there are other uh, differences as well. Now it turns out that it's really easy to generate a TM11 mode. And the uh, classical and by far most common way to do it is simply to start with a waveguide that has a TE11 mode in it, that simplest possible mode, and then increase the diameter of the waveguide. By increasing the diameter of the waveguide, you do two things. First of all, you make this dimension large enough so that you can support a higher order mode, and there's TM11, and then you have to stimulate it somehow, and usually just the act of the discontinuity, introducing the discontinuity is enough to create the uh, TM11 mode. So on this side you have TE11, on this side you have both the TE11 and TM11 modes. Now why do you want to do such a thing? Well, this particular multi-mode field structure turns out to be really useful. And here's why. So again, here's the picture of TE11. If I introduce that step discontinuity, I create TM11 and both modes are now present, TE11 and TM11. And if you just visually add these two fields together, what you see is that in this plane, there is reinforcement, but we see that in other places, the curvature of the field lines is equal and opposite. So in the center of the waveguide, we get field lines which are straight up and down. Whereas in TE11, they're curved, and TM11, they're curved. Furthermore, we see that there is no field along the edge of the waveguide. In the TE11 and TM11 modes, uh, the electric field is non-zero. I mean, E10 is zero, but the normal component is non-zero. Here, both components of the electric field, the normal and tangential components, are both zero. So we have this interesting behavior where we have a zero field very close to the waveguide walls, and then it increases towards the center in both uh, directions, in both planes. And that's very different from what we get in these two situations. So as a result, the aperture is symmetric. And as a further consequence, the pattern will be balanced, and balanced in the sense that we will have equal E and H plane patterns. Now these are desirable characteristics in many situations, but in particular, this is a very useful characteristic to have for a feed, which is going to be used for a reflector antenna, and in particular, for a axisymmetric paraboloidal reflector antenna, because such feeds yield relatively low cross pole. Now let's stop and think about what we have here in terms of equivalent currents. And we can use the good old type one uh, equivalency uh, relationships to kind of interpret what's going on here. Uh, that is both equivalent electric currents and equivalent magnetic currents. Let's think about the equivalent magnetic currents. The electric fields are oriented as shown in this picture. And if I draw a coordinate system here, I'll make it like this, X and Y, and Z is out of the page. So the electric field is Y hat polarized. So there it is, the electric field's Y hat polarized. If I want the equivalent magnetic currents, well, the relationship is minus N hat, and N hat is Z hat in this coordinate system cross the electric field, which is Y hat polarized. So we get that the magnetic currents are X hat polarized. So the magnetic currents go like this. Similarly, we can work out the equivalent electric currents. So uh, the relationship there is surface normal cross 
the uh, magnetic field intensity. Again, the surface normal is z hat in this coordinate system. From the good old plane wave relationship, you see that the magnetic field intensity must be minus x hat polarized. You know that the magnetic field intensity must be minus x hat polarized here because E is oriented this way in the plus y hat direction. H pointed this way means that E cross H is going to give you a pointing vector which is up and out of the page. So this uh, makes sense. And then if we do that calculation, we find out that the equivalent electric current must be minus y hat polarized. In other words, uh, it must go like this. So we see that we have magnetic and electric currents which are perpendicular to each other. This is a Huygens source as we've discussed in previous lectures. So circular apertures derived from mixed modes are very useful uh, in reflector antenna systems. Here's a practical implementation of this whole idea. It's known as a Potter horn, also known as a mixed mode horn, also sometimes known as a multi-mode horn. These terms are all used uh, more or less interchangeably, but sometimes uh, there are other ways you can get a multi-mode structure. So not all multi-mode horns, I guess, are Potter horns, but a Potter horn is typically a multi-mode horn, uh, which is, uh, has a circular uh, cross-section. The analysis and design of a Potter horn is very similar to that of a pyramidal horn, which we've talked about in great detail in a previous lecture. Uh, the considerations are very similar. The general strategy is about the same. You work out some principles, how the field structure should work, uh, you may have to do some empirical analysis to come up with the initial design equations. Uh, you work through those possibilities, and then you test it using full wave solver. That's the, uh, the usual design flow. There is a remaining disadvantage, I should point out, in the Potter horn, and that's the design typically results in a half-power beam width which is less than about 55 degrees. So if you go back and think about our axisymmetric paraboloidal reflector optics, you'll see that that corresponds to f over d's, which are relatively large. So despite the advantages of a Potter horn, typically don't show up for f over d's, which are small. If you have f over d's, which are relatively large, then this turns out to be a great solution. Now, what happens if you don't have a relatively large f over d? Well, then you make compromises. So there's all kinds of uh, ways that you can modify this design approach to get a uh, performance similar to what we're talking about here in terms of emulating a Huygens source. I'll mention a few of those in just a moment. So, concluding remarks. As I mentioned just a few moments ago, the design of circular horns is very similar to the design of rectangular horns. Uh, you can find design equations for getting started to getting uh, initial designs for a, a circular or conical horn and then you can iterate those, and then you test them using a full wave solver. Again, that's the usual design flow. Uh, what's important to know, though, is that circular rectangular horns are not completely different. The principles are the same. The idea is that there's a trade-off between the maximum directivity you can achieve and the axial ratio, and that has to do with cancellation in the aperture. If you understand that basic concept, then you can use that to guide your design effort. Now the enhancements I referred to on the previous slide. I'd just like to mention three. I'm not going to discuss them in detail here, or hardly at all, but you should know about them. One is uh, the corrugated horn. So a corrugated horn looks like this. Here is the starting point, but instead of having the walls be smooth, you introduce a shape like this. So you can think of these as teeth, uh, or what they actually are as corrugations. So uh, this is not unique to circular horns. These can also be used in rectangular horns. But the idea is to create a zero field along the wall of the waveguide, which gives you the same advantages as this TE11, TM11 sum mode. And that, uh, that can increase bandwidth, and it can give you uh, better pattern characteristics. Other possibilities include the scalar horn uh, and uh, choke rings. And these are techniques that you can apply to uh, primarily the circular horns, but 
they can also be applied to some extent to rectangular horns. And there are attempts to modify the boundary conditions along the horn walls and outside the horn aperture to create patterns which are better suited to the specific problem. So frequently it's possible to come up with more compact horn designs that are suitable for the F over D ratios of interest by invoking one or more of these ideas. So uh, I encourage you to the, look those up, look into those possibilities if you think you have an application that falls in that category. This concludes this lecture on circular horns.